Hi, my name is Phil and I like talking about politics and the winner of the poll for today's topic was are there any trade deals we could do quickly? Bear in mind, a number of Brexiteers says we'd absolutely be able to arrange our own trade deals easily within the two years that Article 50 would run. How's it gone? Is it possible uh, to do this? I think I need to do this in three parts, but they're not equal size parts. The first part is just really quickly to go over the difference between a soft Brexit and a hard Brexit for pursuing trade deals. Uh, the second one is a simplistic solution. Uh, for doing trade deals quickly, but that doesn't mean to say not valid. And the third one is the real meat of this, what is important. What have other nations already credibly said about arranging trade conditions quickly? I'm not talking about certain orange people saying, oh yes, we can absolutely do one. What have countries already done? Because remember, here we are pretty much at the end of that two-year process. All our trade deals should be in place by now. So, with a soft Brexit, what this means is we effectively, although we get rid of our membership of the EU, we're still sort of in there. You know, we're still in the single market. Effectively, that's really what I mean. In some guise, we're in the single market and therefore can trade, trade freely with the EU. Um, as, and as well as still having all those arrangements around the world, which doesn't just include full trade deals. People always point to the fact that we've only got full trade deals with so much of the world, but we do have arrangements with lots of other major economies as well, which are not full deals, but they do dictate the tariffs on certain things so we don't have to trade under WTO terms while the EU is trying to negotiate a deal. Um, now, depending on the exact nature of that soft Brexit will depend on whether we are or are not able to pursue our own trade deals with other nations in time without the pressure of having to do it super quickly. Um, because that would be ideal. If we have that pressure of time and needing to get it done any time now, that puts us in a weak negotiating position. Now, with a hard Brexit, of course, you cut off all those ties. So that means we would have no arrangements whatsoever. We won't have any deals with any nation on earth. Uh, that means trade deals, bilateral agreements on trade, security as well. People talk about the trade because that's super important, but security is also uh, important, as well as other, other issues of national and international importance. We won't have any agreements unless we've already arranged to have them in this two-year period. Basically, though, that means we can definitely pursue our own trading arrangements with other nations as we see fit, as well as the EU separately. Um, but these things can typically take 10 years or more. It's fairly typical for a trade deal to take 10 years or more. And I've not seen any examples of any being done in two years, um, you know, or even shorter, of course. But is there any way to get a trade deal quickly? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and put on the simple head here, the way I would think of it, not being someone who has ever seen a trade deal or drawn up a trade deal or anything like that. Um, so, you know, where I get my information from are people who have. The only things I ever say I know about trade deals have come from people who have drawn them up and negotiated them successfully, of course. No good if you weren't successful. But here's the way I think about it. We have copied across the EU statute book to the UK statute book. In other words, all EU laws, even... We obviously, you know, have to follow most of the EU laws. I've already talked in the past about there's a few that we don't like and we don't follow. We're really naughty for that. But either way, uh, when we left the EU, technically we wouldn't be subject to EU laws, if, especially if we're left without a deal. Um, so in order that the UK still has some laws <laughs> and we don't have to go back to medieval laws about being allowed to shoot Welshmen with bows and arrows and any of that nonsense, we've copied across all EU laws to the UK statute books. The idea being then in time, Parliament can decide whether it wants to keep them, amend them or just discard them altogether. And it can do that in its own sweet time. So I would look at this and think, well, OK, so that's for laws. Great. Couldn't we do the same for trade deals? I mean, you know, couldn't we just get an existing trade deal that we have with nations and cross out EU and put UK in instead? It's only like. To, it's even the same number of letters. It doesn't even make the document any longer. Could we not just do that? Um, maybe, maybe not. I mean, with full trade deals, apparently not. We'll get onto that. Um, but that's how I'd think of it. Could we not just do that and, and then 
say to these countries, well, you know, we trade anyway. We, you know, we'd surely want to continue trading on the same terms. If we just do this, this would work, wouldn't it? That's how I would think of it. And I'm sure that's how many other people think of it. But if it was as simple as that, surely we'd have already done that. The government surely has already thought of this. And what I want to do is I want to go over exactly what the government has uh, said about this because they, they you know, they, it's not like they're saying nothing. So on the government website where this is talked about, this is after March 2019 if, if there's no deal. So this is what the government is saying is their intention if there is no deal. So it says during any implementation period, arrangements would be put in place with partner countries so that the UK is treated as an EU member state for the purposes of international agreements, including trade agreements. So the UK is saying even if we leave with no deal, we want the rest of the world to treat us just the same. Can we still trade on the same conditions, the same terms? It says, in the event of a no deal, there will be no implementation period. In this scenario, the government will seek to bring into force bilateral UK third uh, country agreements. Third country just means non-EU countries. Uh, well, actually, in this case, it just means any countries, wouldn't it? Uh, from exit day or as soon as possible thereafter. So they intend to basically just copy and paste those those deals and go to other countries go could you just sign here please we've crossed out eu and put in uk something like that i guess um now they note here that they were talking about bilateral agreements they know we can't get full trade agreements so those are definitely gone bilateral agreements which would i guess from the uk's point of view will just be saying can we just agree to the same tariffs obviously we wouldn't get that with the eu the eu are not going to let us have zero tariff trade without a deal they can't according to wto rules unless they offer that to every other nation with which they don't have a, uh, a trade deal that's going to be ruinous so they're not going to do that so that's half our trade that will definitely we won't be able to do on the current terms but the other half that's the hope uh, it says these new arrangements these new agreements sorry will replicate existing eu agreements and the same preferential effects with third countries as far as possible whilst making the technical changes needed to ensure the agreements operate in a bilateral context. Ministers and officials are engaging regularly with partner countries to complete this work. When we reach final agreements with partner countries will depend, when we re reach them, sorry, will depend on our ongoing discussions with them. So I'll put a link to this in the description below. We're not just going to do a little reader here. Um, so in terms of what has actually been done, so what do we know? Right, so... Dr. Liam Fox is the head of the, the, the ministry in charge of this. He is obviously a hard Brexiteer, member of the ERG. I would advise taking positive statements with a pinch of salt. Look at the actual detail of the wording. So let's go through a few countries because do we have these agreements ready to go for the rest of the world? No, we don't. There are some countries where some progress has been made. So out of all of them, Switzerland, we export, and this is what I'm focusing on, by the way, exports, not imports. Imports is us spending money. Now, of course, if we import essential materials from a country that we then use to make a product and then export it, um, then that is an important country too. But a lot of those are in the EU. More of that in a bit. So Switzerland, our exports to Switzerland are worth 3.8% of our exports altogether, or at least it was a couple of years ago. It's very difficult to get very up-to-date figures. So this is 2016, for which we have the most up-to-date figures. It takes a very long time for these things to come through. The thing is, though, when you look at the breakdown of our exports to Switzerland, because to Switzerland, apparently, we've agreed an arrangement with Switzerland to trade on the same terms. The problem is, although... The UK government are saying it's agreed. I can't find where Switzerland has said it's agreed. That doesn't mean to say they haven't, just because I can't find it. But let's say they have. The The issue is that it, nothing has been signed yet, but it, but they are worth 3.8% of our exports. And But the issue is, when you look at it, three quarters of those exports are gems and precious metals. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't think we mine very much of that in Britain. I'm guessing we get them from elsewhere and, and trade them on. Um, in which case, if we don't have an arrangement with those countries which supply us with the gemstones and precious metals, might that cause an issue? Might they increase in price and therefore we become less competitive? So there is an issue on that. I'm not an expert in the gems and precious stones market or indeed any international market. So I can't say whether that would be an issue or not. 
It's just a cautionary thing there. And also the fact that we haven't signed anything. We are two, two months away and we haven't yet signed anything. Uh, so I would think of that. If it's been agreed, and I know sometimes being agreed doesn't mean that everything has been agreed. It just means we're close sometimes. But that close can be a year away still. We'll have to wait and see. Um, the other thing is, though, because, I mean, this is a, a fair chunk of our exports. Journalists have been asking the ministry, so when, are we, when can we see a signature? And they've not been able to get any answers on that. So that, to me, doesn't sound like it's imminent. You know, the government may be saying, oh, we hope it'll be done by the 29th of March. But I, I, if you can't say when, if you haven't arranged a signing ceremony or anything like that, not that it needs a ceremony or such, but you usually have one. Um, I, is it going to be done in like 60 days? I don't, I don't know. Anyway, next one. With Israel, apparently we have agreed in principle a free trade deal. Now, so first of all, what are the value? What's the value of this? The value of our exports to Israel is about one percent of our exports. Okay, so I'm not going to poo-poo it just because one percent doesn't sound very much. One percent is still a decent chunk, I would say. And of course, we've you know we're going to have bits of trade with everyone. We need as much of that as possible. We can't sack any of it off. But the thing is, the term "agreed in principle" just means that Israel and the UK have decided, yeah, we'd like to come to a free trade deal agreement. That doesn't mean to say anything's in writing, and indeed nothing is in writing. That's the sort of thing you say at the start of the 10-year period of negotiating. When you say you've agreed something in principle, that is the starting point for the negotiations. Those negotiations to get it actually to formalise could take years. It usually do take years. It's not like, you know, in extreme cases, it can take up to 10 years. No, it takes on average about 10 years. Um so we just have to, again, wait to see on that. But that doesn't sound like it's going to be anything that's going to happen quickly. Australia and New Zealand have agreed to an arrangement and there's a signature. It's not a deal. It's not a trade deal. It's an arrangement, bilateral agreement, um, which, of course, sort of sets tariffs, things like that. Now, our trade, I, I can't really find our trade to New Zealand. I think it's quite small. But if you look at our trade to Australia, it's about one and a half percent. So maybe you could add a little bit onto that. Um, I couldn't really see it in the thing in the list. Quite small, I imagine. Um, obviously, it's going to be smaller than Australia. Otherwise, it would have shown up. So let's say you're a little under two percent for Australia and New Zealand. We do have that signed, though. That so that is basically we can carry on trading with Australia on the same terms after Brexit, even a no deal Brexit signed, sealed and delivered. That one sorted. We're good. We're still going to be able to get our Jacobs Creek. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. The thing that concerns me about that, though, is when you look again, look at the exports, what we export to Australia and New Zealand. A fair chunk of our exports are vehicles and machinery. Now, I don't know anything about gemstones and precious metals beyond a little bit of metallurgy. But I do know that the manufacture of vehicles and machinery in this country relies upon materials and most especially parts being traded from the EU, a fair number from Germany. Now, in time, you could say that, that you know, we could manufacture our own, but the fact that we already haven't, I don't know, it sort of suggests, first of all, we don't have the expertise to, we can't have a factory spring up overnight after all. So in terms of supplying those exports immediately, if we don't have a deal with the EU, that means that those parts that we need and those materials are going to have tariffs on them. So they're going to cost these companies more money. We already know that the government's chief economic advisor has suggested completely cutting the cord on the car industry. So vehicles, I mean, he, I'm not suggesting that they are definitely going to do that. But this guy who is very influential and has been since the days of Thatcher is saying we need to cut it, to abandon it completely. Um, that doesn't look good for the sale of vehicles. And that's one of our big exports to the only nations that have actually signed anything at the moment. Um, and as I say, even if not, uh, the fact that those parts are going to need... Um, I mean, we can't just have factories that only specialise in selling vehicles to Australia and New Zealand. You know, they need to sell elsewhere, don't they? And 
and uh, the parts are going to cost more. So that means our vehicles and machinery cost more in Australia and New Zealand. Now, if there's other parts of the world that make the same things, and it's just that at the moment uh, we're competitive for it, well, we're going to become uncompetitive. So our best hope re relies upon the fact that it, uh, it's the only place you can get these things. No one else thinks of making the same things for less. And, and therefore, we just they just have to swallow the, the import fee. Um, but that may be vain hope. That may be vain hope there. So that is a worry for me. You know, we get our wine. They may not get their machinery and vehicles, at least not on the same prices. That's an issue. And this is the thing. Everything is connected. You can't just say, um, like, OK, we have this much trade with this country. Oh, we've signed an agreement. Therefore, it's going to carry on and maybe even flourish because it's all connected. Like, you know, there's a there's a web of, of supply and demand in, globally in products you know for a particular product it's like okay to make this product we need these materials these materials these materials we need to get them from these countries if you don't have an agreement with those countries it's more difficult to get them it's not just more costly it's more difficult to get them um because you know when you don't have trade agreements it's nothing it's not just to do with tariffs it's also trade barriers the trade barriers are worse to get over getting them might take longer and and then for selling them on sometimes you sell it on to one country and then that country wants to sell it on to another and again if you've got trade agreements missing with other countries that are part of that web it can affect it can affect the trade you have with the one you do have an agreement with and that's something that people don't always appreciate um final little one apparently south africa has said they're really close to signing a deal but we haven't said that and we haven't even agreed anything apparently when the government was asked we haven't agreed anything um, exports to South Africa, incidentally, are about 0.8%, just a little under 1%. Um, so again, not, not something that you can just abandon. But at the same time, if nothing's been agreed, that means there's nothing to sign. There isn't a document. So I don't know what's going to happen there either. Um, so going back to the government's plan, and again, this is what I was thinking in my own head as well. It, it actually makes sense to me, but then I don't know anything about these deals. So you say, okay... So what the government are saying, we just want to copy across those arrangements and ask the rest of the world. But here's what people who do negotiate these things are saying. And this all, and you've got to bear in mind, okay, I know some people don't like the experts, even though that's just madness, but never mind. Look at the facts. The fact is, out of all the countries, because we should have been able to do this already, shouldn't we? We should have had every country on board to sign the existing agreements. After all, we've copied across EU laws. So that shouldn't be an issue. Because one objection is, these trade deals tend to refer to EU law. That's part of the agreement. Now, if we've copied across EU law, well, we can just, again, still cross out those bits because those are now UK law, so that's still valid. But the people who do deal with these negotiations say a few things. First of all, which, again, explains why we don't have a lot of these arrangements. So, first of all, um, although we've copied across EU laws, a lot of people could look at the UK from the outside or indeed the inside and say the reason we voted for Brexit was so that we could amend those laws, discard those laws even. Um, and, and it's very likely that that's the intention of the UK government. Now, I don't know whether that's the intention of the UK government because we've got to bear in mind UK governments have actually voted for these laws in the first place. But people take that view. So other countries have to take that view. And that means we're an unknown quantity. They don't know what the legal position is going to be in Britain when it comes to goods um, in a year's time or in two years time. Maybe they're going to set fire to these statutes. They're going to be discarding them, ripping them up like confetti. They don't know. And, and they don't like not knowing. Then there's another issue. Um, so basically, just in terms of the economic situation, there's a, a lot of nations that just want to see what Brexit's going to be. They don't even know at the moment what form of Brexit we're going to, to agree to, effectively. And I know a lot of people say, well, the default position is a no-deal Brexit, and that's if Parliament can't agree anything. But Parliament have already agreed they don't want no deal. So it, it will take a definite decision of Parliament whatever happens. You know, if we end up crashing out with no deal, that's not because Parliament's deadlocked. That's because Parliament has said that it's preferable to them doing something else. So that's a potential issue. 
Um, so they don't, they don't know what the political or economic situation is going to be. They want to wait and see. Part of the reason they want to see is because at the moment we've got decent trade deals and decent trading arrangements with these other countries because it was negotiated on part of the EU, which is a large, not only very experienced at these things, but large, got a lot of money to spend. And like I keep saying, if you go, into a, if you go to someone who supplies you with things, if you spend a lot of money and you are a significant chunk of their exports, um, you get a lot of say and you get to get some decent terms. If you're a much smaller part of those experts, which we would be, then hmm, they might look at that deal as being better for us than for them. And they reckon after a year or two, they could get better conditions out of us once we're a bit desperate. So they're hanging back. They know that OK, they'd like a trade deal with us because that helps them too. But at the same time, they're thinking longer term and longer term, especially if we don't have if they don't export that much to us, then they're thinking, hmm, we'll just wait because we reckon they might be a bit desperate in a year's time and we'll just grab at any trade deal we dangle in front of them. So basically, after two years, what we have on paper is a continuation with just under 2% of our export market. That doesn't mean to say that the other 98% is going to disappear up in smoke. Of course not. Um, just some of it. But the thing is, largely on goods, I'll just remind you that we can only manufacture at the moment with materials and parts from the EU, which would become more expensive when we have to pay tariffs on them if we leave without a deal with the EU. So... That's the situation in terms of what arrangements we can try and get. The government are still saying they're going to try and set up bilateral arrangements on the exit day and or very soon after. If you want to carry on believing that, then you carry on believing that. But that's what I found out. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to give it a like. Subscribe for further content. Click the bell notification so that you'll be notified not only of further content, but the polls that go out. There will be a poll, but this time it's for Monday's video. Tomorrow's video is one I'm going to choose. Someone put a very interesting comment down, and I want to talk. I'd not consider this. I want to talk about that tomorrow. So I'm choosing the topic tomorrow. But anyway, have a good day. Until next time, I'll see you later.